All right, thanks everybody for uh, bearing with us on the slow start there. Um, welcome to uh, the discussion on making Drupal the best REST server. Um, it's important for me to note that uh, in this conversation, I'm the outsider. Um, so we've got some uh, seagulls that have been doing amazing work on uh, REST integration for Drupal 8. And uh, this, this talk uh, should not in any way be interpreted as a criticism of anything they've done. In fact, it's the opposite. Um, they're doing uh, amazing work, and uh, it's incredibly useful. And I look forward to working with them on the Code Sprint on Friday. But so far, I've not contributed anything towards the Web Services Initiative. Uh, so this is, this is an outsider's perspective. This is what uh, someone who is just starting out with Drupal 8 when it's released and wants to investigate this Web Services thing might find out. Uh, that's been the experience that I've, I've tried to go through over the past few weeks as I've prepared for this talk. So um, in my day job, uh, recently uh, we went through a multi-week process of evaluating front-end JavaScript MVC frameworks. So things like Ember and Angular and Knockout. And um, you know, I'm not sure that we found out which was the best of those many choices, but what we definitely found out is that there are a lot of good choices. These things are very powerful. Um, most of them are very easy to dive into with uh, some uh, pretty minimal JavaScript skills. And so that just confirmed for me uh, an intuition that had been growing that um, page reloads on the web are going to become a thing of the past and uh, they're already rapidly moving in that direction. Um, we're developing a whole new category of web developer um, that I think we might call client-side back-end. You know, so it used to be you'd have JavaScript people who do front-end who make things look pretty, but now we're actually building our applications on the client-side. And so the uh, server-side back-end developer is uh, going to become more and more concerned with simply uh, building good APIs and uh, providing uh, performance data servers. Uh, so I think we need to be ready for this. I think uh, Drupal 8 is uh, very aware of that and, and doing an excellent job. And so uh, I, I've spent my time not looking at the Drupal resources uh, in terms of conversations about, uh, you know, in the patch queues about issues of should we implement this way or that way. I've spent my time looking at other things, at other things that are implementing REST, at other things people have written about REST, studying uh, Roy, Roy Fielding's uh, dissertation that introduced the concept of REST and some of his further commentary on how uh, you know, REST can be uh, leveraged for, for the future of the web. So one of the other uh, leading uh, options that a lot of people are being uh, attracted to for building uh, web services is Node.js. Um, Microsoft has gotten very behind um, promoting Node.js on their Azure cloud, and they're hosting really good free boot camps, you know, teaching people how to code JavaScript and, and Node.js to build server-side applications. And the, uh, when I talk about Node.js, by the way, throughout this entire talk, not just this slide, I'm really talking about Node.js plus the Express uh, module, which makes it really easy to build web services. It basically gives you your, uh, your put, get, post methods, and you just attach them to callbacks and you're done. So um, that's been my experience as I've tested things and benchmarked, and I have some numbers I'm going to show you. Um, but just, just be aware, it's not just pure Node.js, it's Node.js plus Express. And the approach there is, you know, here's your interface, what do you want to pass through it? And the great thing about Node.js being non-blocking is you can go out and grab external resources from, from different places and, and build up uh, complex documents, complex resources that are uh, a mashup of data that uh, can be served uh, to the client very, very quickly. And uh, you compare that to the, the Drupal model where we kind of assume all your data lives in our database. You've, you've built it out with content types and views. And, and the tools that Drupal provides, and uh, we've done all the work for you, and here's, here's a, a faucet that you can suck it through. So um, there are two different approaches, and, and, and they're solving two slightly different problems. So you know, maybe it's, it's an open question whether we ought to move in one direction or the other, and I think that's something we can talk about, but I think it's, it's something to be aware of. So uh, I decided to, to cast the issue that REST tries to solve as a user story. Um, 
you can read it there, but as an API consumer, I want to be able to discover all of the resources available to me via a small generalized set of methods so that the service is self-documenting. REST is the solution that uh, implements this user story. So um, I'm going to assume people are basically familiar with, with REST and the idea of, of using HTTP methods to access resources. Um, I've also assumed that people are basically familiar with Node.js. Does anybody not know what Node.js is? I guess I should clarify that. OK, everybody knows what Node.js is. So, um, so we've got the basics down in Drupal 8. I mean, the, the REST server that's there right now, I just pulled it down from the Git repository on Friday. You know, it does the basics, and it does them well. Uh, so uh, what my notes here are uh, the things that we still need to make improvements on, things we need to finish on. So maybe these will be motivations for things to work on on the code sprint on Friday or to contribute towards. Um, so the, the move to using HAL, HAL JSON as a format compared to, we were talking about JSON LD, the last DrupalCon, uh, that was a great choice because um, I think the, the best REST APIs give a choice between uh, you know, receiving a resource that simply has links to all the dependent resources or that actually nests the dependent resources in them. That's what, that's what HAL does, it allows you to nest the right resources. So in our sense, uh, you have a node, it has some data about the node, a title, a body, but it also has an author. And that's really a reference to another entity that the server can tell you about. So rather than just providing a URI to say, hey, if you want to know about the author, go to this ent you know, entity slash user slash 26, um, we can actually nest that user object in there if the, uh, if the client has requested the hell JSON format. Um, but uh, the hell is incomplete as it stands right now by my judgment. Um, it's some things you wouldn't expect. For example, with files, um, what you get back is a files object which has a file ID for where to find that file in the files table in the database, but there's no URI for the file itself. Uh, so that kind of seems like a, a major oversight in uh, hell handling of files. There's some stuff missing in, in users. And the uh, URIs that are generated are not actually reusable by the client. Um, and maybe that's, I, I'm guessing that's just an artifact of switching over uh, some of the recent HAL things. Um, if there's some reason, if I'm not understanding the, the URL format or the URI format for the uh, resources in HAL, I'd love for someone to uh, explain that to me from the web services team. But my understanding is that with an ideal REST server, the URIs that you get back are uh, simply uh, paths that the client can then call out to to get that object. And right now, that doesn't work. The URIs you get back aren't even uh, rooted in the entity path that the REST server uses. So that's one thing that we, that we need to fix. Um, but if we do that and we do that well, that'll be an edge on uh, some of the other out-of-the-box REST solutions. So uh, one of the fundamental uh, tenets of REST is that the uh, protocol um, doesn't actually matter. You can use any protocol you like, but of course uh, we're concerned uh, with HTTP. And there are a few things that um, HTTP provides that, uh, that we could make use of to uh, really add some of Drupal's power into our uh, REST API. Um, first, I, I know that there was a switch from using put to patch. I think supporting patch is a good thing, but it's not actually in RFC 2616. It's, it's uh, not completely standardized. Um, and put is assumed. Every, every REST client uh, is going to expect to be able to support a put request to write back to the <laughs> server. So um, I think we should add that in there. I realize that's not easy because of uh, field level uh, permissions handling. Uh, so it's going to take some, some thinking about the best way to do that, but I think it would, we'd be missing a major piece if we didn't have some, re, uh, some support for put requests that do something sane that a client would expect it to do, because um, clients aren't going to know to then try patch when they get a method not supported response from their put request. So um, Drupal's got some really cool capabilities with um, batch and queue, and, and we almost get to the point of being able to do asynchronous um, processing in some cases. And uh, so if we get to the point of, of wanting to be able to um, you know, pull data from external sources, you know, we, we're not quite non-blocking like uh, Node.js can be. But um, with, with our batch and queuing system, we could uh, queue up jobs to, to gather assets from remote servers. And the way that uh, HTTP supports that is with a 202 response uh, accepted. 
and uh, that's basically uh, defined there for you. And we can return with that accepted response a post callback to tell Drupal, hey, once you've got this data, send it back to me. Don't make me call you back for it. Um, so that could be a, a really powerful service that we could provide. The uh, other alternative is to uh, do a uh, 201, which is to say that this uh, job resource has been created, and here's a URI that you can pull to check and see when we're done. Uh, so it would be great if we could implement those as well for uh, some more complex uh, long-term processing and uh, reporting and the kinds of things that you might want to do with the uh, diversity of, of content and services that Drupal can access. So um, when you strip things down past uh, the web and get down to the bare bones HTTP protocol, uh, we kind of suck at caching. It, it's time to end the expires hack with Dree's birthday. We'll put Dree's birthday somewhere else in the code base. You know, that's fine. Uh, but uh, we, sh we should be using cache control and expires the way that they are intended to be used so that uh, clients that are, uh, you know, single page apps that are consuming Drupal content and request the same node don't have to go back to the server for it unless there's a good reason for it. So entities need to be able to define their own caching structures and, uh, and set these headers uh, uh, very easily. Um, without uh, kind of bucking the trend of what Drupal's doing out of the box. And, and yes, I checked the rest servers. Headings are still uh, no cache and, and the expires. There's also e-tags are coming on the scene as another way of, of managing caching. And um, there's some complex interactions between these three things, and they all can kind of seem to do the same thing. And so we should have conversations about um, how, how we want to use those. Uh, the other thing is that um, one of the best things you can do for Drupal caching is outside of Drupal. Um, almost everybody doing serious Drupal in production is using Varnish or something like it these days. And this may seem controversial, but I think we should ship a Varnish VCL with Drupal 8. Um, it's kind of a pain in the ass to figure out all the different ways to handle image cache and, uh, and some of the special exceptions and AJAX callbacks and things. Um, when they can and can't be handled by Varnish and when they should pass through. And I've seen some suggested VCLs on the web that are very broken, specifically for Drupal, uh, that, that will just uh, wreck things. And so it's still an effort to set up uh, your Varnish correctly for Drupal. And of course, people are going to say, well, come on, we're not going to uh, you know, add a, a dependency or relation to a, a third party system in Drupal. But actually, we've been doing it some, since the beginning. We ship an HD access file. So uh, now we ship a web, web config file for Microsoft. Why don't we ship a Varnish VCL? Um, you know, if, if nothing else, that would, uh, that would be a big win on the caching front. So uh, the, the next thing that we'll spend some time looking at is, is some actual benchmarking numbers, because I think the other key thing for a data server is it has to be fast. Um, not just because people like things to be fast, but because of the nature of single page apps that are constantly making requests back to the server, the number of uh, round trips that we're making, the number of requests that we're making is uh, going to increase exponentially, uh, potentially, as we have resources embedded inside of resources. And uh, even if you just want to do something as simple as an infinite scroll feature we're seeing all over the place, you know, I don't want delays when I'm scrolling. I want that, that content to be right there. So I, I did a number of comparisons. Um, uh, Drupal to some other things, and uh, these are not fair comparisons. All of this should be taken with a grain of salt, but as we get through it, there are a couple of interesting things and a couple of things that surprised me. So uh, first, over here on the right, uh, oh, I should explain what this, this graph is. This is um, number of uh, requests served per second. Uh, so higher is better. Uh, higher is faster. Higher is I can handle more traffic uh, more quickly. The blue bar is um, a uh, Apache benchmark. These are both Apache benchmark checks. The blue bar is a large number of requests with a relatively small concurrency. The uh, orange bar is a smaller number of requests with a higher concurrency. So uh, on the right here, we have uh, Drupal 8 out of the box, REST server with a view for uh, providing a a view of titles. And, and, and all of these tests all the way through, all I'm really uh, requesting is, is node titles, just to, to keep it simple. Um, so uh, you know, it's, it's returning a JSON object. It's an array of objects that have 
one or maybe two properties. Um, the main thing we're looking for is, is title. Uh, some of them, uh, because some of the other frameworks also include an ID or a sorting uh, property on that. But uh, so that's Drupal out of the box. Uh, the next one that's just labeled module, um, in that case what I did is I, I built a Drupal 8 module using the um, YAML routing technique that's new. So not using hook menu to, to define my routes and a uh, very simple controller callback, um, you know, a, a naked class with a single method to uh, uh, use the symphony JSON response. And uh, in that, I cheated. Uh, I used MySQL query uh, to skip over the database layer. So I just wanted to, to see basically, you know, what, how is the routing layer affecting us? How is the... Um, you know, the, the overall code load of Drupal affecting things, uh, skipping the database layer, skipping views, skipping the REST server and all of that. And uh, so we see we, we get about 50% more um, requests per second there. So uh, there is room to, for improvement uh, above, the, uh, above the basic layer in, in terms of views and the REST server. Uh, the next, we're looking at uh, Node.js, and again, this is very similar to what I did with the, the bare module. Um, again, it's with the Express, so it does have uh, routing built in and uh, have a route to a, a single page that does the same query that Views was doing, um, which is a select title um, order by random uh, from the same MySQL database. So in all these cases, I was pointing at the Drupal MySQL database. And you can see we're an order of magnitude faster than Drupal out of the box. Now, this isn't necessarily a surprise, right? Um, we, you know, we're, we're comparing a very simple uh, single page script to a full framework. Uh, so that's not terrible. In fact, I, I said to somebody yesterday, he's here so you can, you can check me on this. I said I expect it to be about an order of magnitude faster, and that's basically what it is. We go from around uh, 100 requests a second to uh, just over 1,000 requests a second. The only surprising thing here is that the uh, concurrency uh, takes such a big hit on Node. Uh, that I did not expect to see. So um, that's interesting. I don't know what that means, but uh, that's there. So uh, from there, I, I kept going because I wanted to compare uh, more things and more ways of accessing data by uh, REST. So the, the graph just rescaled itself. Note we now go to 4,000 over there. And what we've added uh, on the left is uh, requests to MongoDB's built-in REST server. So at this point, we're not using MySQL. Um, and so you see the Drupal, these are the same Drupal numbers that you just saw in the previous chart, but relative to MongoDB, they've, they've shrunk quite a bit. Uh, again, no surprise here, there's no framework at all. This is just um, pinging the, the Mongo server, there's no MySQL. And in fact, it gets to cheat a lot too because in the MySQL, I was using a random sort and Mongo does not support that. So in, in this particular test, um, let's see, was I just doing the exact same query? I, I, I did come up with a way to cycle through queries um, for uh, later tests with Mongo. Um, but this number is really kind of relevant and striving for that kind of performance in a full framework versus just a database that happens to have a, a REST API is, is ridiculous. But I wanted it on the chart for, for comparison. So this is where it gets interesting uh, because that new bar that we've added, again, we've just rescaled the, the graph. Those four numbers on the right are all the same ones you just saw. This is uh, bare PHP and MySQL. This is a you know index.php file that calls MySQL query and again runs the same query that Drupal was running in the beginning, and uh, so it's twice as fast as the Mongo REST server, and it's an order of magnitude faster than Node and MySQL. So if anyone says to you, "Well, we're doing a web service, we need to use Node because it's faster," well, actually, it's not. You could um, build a, a much faster um, REST API for a data in MySQL anyway um, by, you know, auto-generating an index PHP file for each resource and, uh, you know, letting Apache do your routing and, and be done. It'd be vastly faster. So Node does not automatically win on the speed front, you know, comparing programming language to the programming language at, at the bare bones level. So that, that was surprising. And again, we've just rescaled, and so now we're using uh, Node and its favorite database, Mongo. So 
the huge difference here between Node with Mongo and Node with MySQL is is really interesting, and I wonder if that's um, you know has to do with the maturity of the two drivers. Everybody loves Mongo. I don't know if that has to do with with Bison, um, but uh, at that point, um, you know, we're in a whole new ball game, and uh, Drupal has almost vanished off the chart. Uh, so, um, what can we do about this? I mean, should we be trying to compete with this? Uh, I don't think that's realistic at this point. Uh, so, uh, what can we do? Well, I think um, first off, um, the biggest game being seen, uh, bringing Mongo in there, we need to. We need to make sure that uh, supporting Mongo and other document-oriented databases, other key value stores, um, is easy to do in Drupal 8. And I know work is being done on that. One of the key pieces to really make that uh, viable is the um, entity field query uh, backend for views. And there's a module out there that's labeled alpha and says you're crazy if you use it in production. But I've heard other people say, no, actually, it works pretty good. Um, and that's for Drupal 7. Um, I don't know where we're at at Drupal 8, so since this is a core conversation, I don't know if Chex is here or anyone else who knows about the state of that could maybe give us a quick update on how we're doing with our Mongo support in Drupal 8. But um, let's keep that as a priority. Um, and then uh, I think we can partner with Node.js uh, instead of uh, viewing it as a competitor because uh, when we're uh, returning links in our JSON documents, um, actually, whether it's it's pure JSON with just you know, URIs, or whether it's HAL with embedded things, um, there's nothing that says that those URIs have to point back to Drupal. Um, in, in an ideal case, we could do nothing but switch the port so that if you're a client that just cares about pulling down the data, uh, first you get all the data related to the object, and, and Drupal handles that. But then we can go to a completely different service um, or a completely different server running the same service uh, to retrieve the rest of the data that's related to that. And so then we can get node uh, style performance for everything after our first request to a, a Drupal data API. I also think just to prove to the world that um, Drupal is an awesome platform for building um, next generation web apps that don't have page refreshes, we should try and ship, ship Drupal 8 with a single page theme. I talked to Dries about this at uh, DrupalCon uh, Down Under in Sydney, and he thought it was a great idea, and it's definitely something we can do past code freeze. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, um, maybe we could get a group together on Friday to, to uh, talk about uh, the pieces that would be needed to make that happen. But I'd, I'd really like to see a, a Drupal theme that supports you know, navigating everything in the site from an end user perspective. Um, I don't think we need to tackle the administrative experience this way, but from an end user perspective, I want to be able to access all the content, all the blocks, all the menus in my Drupal site uh, without a page reload. Uh, that would be pretty cool. So um, that's all I've got. Um, I, I remember the core conversations in San Francisco were a lot shorter, and uh, we're a, we broke up into groups and discussed details. This is a pretty big group to coordinate side conversations. But uh, I welcome anyone with uh, questions or comments to come up to the microphone. Um, please do, because this is being recorded. Um, anyone involved in the uh, web services initiative and the uh, views uh, back end. Um, if you want to give us a quick report on where that stands and how people can help out, um, please let's let's have a conversation. Hey there. Um, so just one explanation why we removed the put support for uh, the entity resource plugin in Drupal core. So with entities you have field access, so you have different representations of the same node because depending on the user that accesses the node, the fields are different. And the specification of put in the HTTP protocol says that you should just take over the resource that was um, sent to your server. And if you're a client that is not able to access the fields, you cannot really put the node there again without the field because it would be deleted. That's, that's what put is used for. That's why we removed it for entity resource plugins. But um, that doesn't mean that you can't use it for other resource plugins. So we made the architecture so that we have um, a plugin in core that covers entities. And we do all the CRUD support for them, create, read, update, and delete. 
But of course, you can write your own plugin that does the data handling for you, not working with entities, for example, or working with entities in a different way. And you still have the serialization on top of that um, that converts all the data that you create down to, to HAL or JSON, whatever you want. Right. Yeah, I'd like to see that um, plugin architecture be as easy to use as the Express framework in, in Node.js. You know, it really ought to be, here's my object, dot put, here's, you know, what to do when you get a put request. Exactly, and yeah. that's basically how it works in Drupal 8. Um, so we, you have, according to the HTTP request methods, you have just the, the methods on that object, one for patch, one for get, one for post, one for delete, for example, for the entity resource plugin. And then you get in either the ID or already the deserialized object um, that was handled by the serializer before. So you don't, don't, you don't have to do any serialization. That was the goal for the resource plugins in Drupal 8. And yeah, that's basically it. The architecture isn't that uh, sophisticated. No. Yeah, thanks. Anyone in the room who's done anything with um, alternate databases besides MySQL uh, in Drupal 8? Anyone? Uh, where did they go? Is there a database session going on right now? Uh, I'm optimistic about that. I just, I just don't know where it stands. Um, Mongo for Drupal 7 is working pretty well in most cases, uh, at least for accessing entities. Again, views is, is an issue. So I have a question about integrating Node.js, um, the thing that you currently get with the way that Drupal's implemented even though it's slower, it's not just like he was saying, well, kind of what he was saying earlier about having access to certain fields. So if we're gonna use node.js as our backend REST server, how do we get all of the other permissions, like field permissions, uh, content type permissions, and everything into node.js so that it's not, we don't get security breaches? Mm -hmm. in fact. Um, so first off, I'll say we may not be able to. Um, I, I think um, field level permissions you know, are not used all the time. There are a lot of sites that don't have them at all. But the other thing is that we could view um, each each variant as a uh, separate resource so that, uh, you know, for each role that has different permissions, maybe we actually have a, a different, um, you know, a different collection in Node.js. I don't know, that's just off the top of my head. But there are ways, there are ways to deal with that. Um, I think, but yeah, it, it may just be a case of, you know, if you have field level permissions, this isn't supported. But um, I think there are enough cases where that's not the issue that it's still worth doing. I um, highly recommend um, Roy Fielding's blog for uh, follow up information on. Um, you know, ways to do REST and, and basically do a Google search for Roy Fielding and REST and you'll find a lot of conversations and rebuttals and uh, approaches and people defending, well, why my API really is RESTful even though Roy said it wasn't. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, good resources to be found. Yeah, go ahead. What do you see as the use case for single page websites within Drupal? Um, you know, I don't know that it's a, a use case any different from a traditional website um, it's just about giving them more responsive, more fluid user experience. So, the, I mean, the issue with single page has always been SEO. And sure. So, I've always seen it as more of an application type of thing, which yep. people has used far less for. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just curious. You know, I'm, I'm really interested, and in, I've done a lot of work with single page apps, but not so much sites. Sure. I mean, well, the great thing about Drupal is it makes it so easy to provide your site in. Uh, multiple formats, and again, if we're talking about a, mm -hmm. a single page theme, we could also enable a, a traditional theme that we serve to search engines, um, mm -hmm. you know, so all of these things that, that can be done, uh, we can have graceful degradation for. Mm -hmm. So I think we can still serve the, the search engines well if, if we make a point of it, and Drupal makes it mm -hmm. easy for us um, because of the, you know, the ability to serve multiple themes, the ability to have multiple response formats. 
I don't, I don't see that as a major issue, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I realize a lot of people who have built single page apps from the ground up kind of left SEO as an afterthought and went, oops. Right. Um, but in the case of Drupal, um, mm -hmm. you know, we've got multiple output formats from the mm -hmm. get-go. So one okay. of our output I just, formats is... I just curious if you had any more thoughts on that. So thanks. Yeah. I haven't really looked at it uh, at all yet, but I was wondering about using something like a view mode to uh, to limit the data instead of using uh, field level permissions. You're saying maybe just not support field level permissions, but instead use something like a view mode to have a limited uh, scope in, in the uh, RESTful API. So, you know, just like you use it for, you know, for different displays of the content as it is, instead of just saying, this is all the data for the node, create a limited, you know, data set that returns. Uh, yeah, I don't think that helps us any in the node Mongo integration style, because still, um, you know, Mongo doesn't know anything about view modes. So again, the solution would be exactly the same as what I said before, we have separate <laughs> collections with uh, separate uh, permissions on the Mongo side. But um, um, yeah, I, 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 think, uh, I think, you know, the, the question it, from a security perspective too is, you know, um, once you've given them access to the object in, in any form, whether you're only showing them some fields on, on one view, um, if you've given them access to the object, then you're potentially opening up other ways for them to view the full object. Right. right? So the, the OWASP project calls that uh, insecure direct object references or something. There's a fancy name for it. And so um, the, real, the, the real thing you wanna do if you're concerned about the security of those fields is field level permission. Okay, but you were saying to not have that at all, so. It'd be kind of well. Uh, so the idea is, if you have field level permissions, then you're going to have to route all your requests through Drupal. But if okay. you have some content types that don't, or some roles that uh, don't, then maybe you can. Okay, so you're not saying Mongo to. Uh, so you're saying just handle it through Drupal and not have that sort of second layer with Mongo as well. Right. Oh, right. Okay. Right. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for thinking about REST with me and. Um, Go build some awesome single page apps with Drupal 8. Thank you.